Hello, I'm Julian from Worldwide Christian Travel and welcome to Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, Who, What, Why and Especially Where with Joel Weinberg. A synopsis along with more information about Joel, Worldwide Christian Travel and GGC can be found in the description. Please give a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you enjoy the lecture. Joel, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. It's been a bit of a time, so it's good to be back. We're going to be having a theological and maybe a little bit of a spiritual, but it also a tourist oriented trip of Caesarea Philippi and the area around. Now there's no better place to start our visit than seeing Caesarea Philippi. Here we can see stables of the grand city. This part was actually built by King Agrippa II, middle of the middle of the first century. He was the actually the last Jewish ruler before the destruction of the temple, this part of the great city that he built. In Matthew 16, which is the main story of what happened here, the most in-depth story we read, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man am? And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Of course, keep in mind that all these people, including John the Baptist, were already dead. So you are, in a way, the reincarnation, the spirit of these people. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Yonah. Let's translate here bar Jonah. Bar in Aramaic means son, like Bar Mitzvah, the son of the commandments, because his name was actually Shimon Bar Yonah, for the flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, this is a divine revelation you have had. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter. In other words, your name is no longer Simon. I will call you Peter, meaning a stone. We'll talk a lot about that in a few minutes. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, we'll all talk about that, shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, we'll talk about that also, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose, loose in, on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should not tell no man, that he was Jesus the Christ. Christ, the anointed one, Christ Christo, coming from Hebrew, Mashiach. Mashiach is someone who is anointed. Nice Civil War picture. Why are we saying that? Because a great biblical scholar explains that coming to Matthew 16 is almost like visiting a Civil War historical site. Because the wars that take place have taken place in interpreting it, of course, the Catholic Church says this is the beginning of the popes, because Peter being the first pope, and of course, the Protestant theologians had a very different approach. Now, let's start our journey. We're heading over Israel, the lower Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, the lower part of the Sea of Galilee, Heading up the Sea of Galilee to the left, we can see the city of Tiberias. To the right, we can see Corsi, where the story with the swines took place. Of course, Capernaum, very important. We can see the Sea of Galilee, the beautiful, and now the Sea of Galilee is more beautiful than it's been in, I could even say, decades. It is fuller and flowing and beautiful. So. Now that we've gotten a preliminary, let's have another interesting, there's an interesting part once again of Caesarea Philippi itself. Mark's story is a little bit different. And Jesus went out and his disciples into towns of Caesarea Philippi. Also, interesting of towns because it was a spread out area. And by the way, keep that in mind. So on the side of the road in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying unto them, whom do men, who do men say I am? And they answer, John the Baptist, some say Elias, and others, one of the prophets. They left out a prophet, but that's less important. And he saith unto them, 
but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of this. So Peter's name was not given here, according to Mark, but Peter was already called Peter. But that's a whole different story. Here we see one of the, probably the most important Christian mosaic in the world, very early, fourth century, mosaic, of course, of the feeding of the multitude, the two fish, and the four loaves of bread, if you can see here. This is in the church of Tagbaha, the church of the seven springs, where this traditionally took place. Again, the artistic interpretation, quite amazing, already that four loaves of bread, because, of course, Jesus is the fifth. Why did they put this here? Because, according to Luke, this took place right after the feeding of the multitudes. And Luke says, And it came to pass, and he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. So this, in, in the story of Luke, it starts with prayer. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answered. Their answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. So once again, slightly different story, and interesting if you notice here, not mentioning Caesarea Philippi. Here we can see the picture, the statue, we'll get a better view of it in one minute, of Peter himself, as it is, as it is in his new, where Jesus declared his new hometown. I don't know if Peter felt at home because this was the town of his mother-in-law. He was from Bethsaida, but that's less important. John tells us an interesting thing. And he tells us this. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, or Kaipha probably, which is by interpretation a stone. Caiaphas, of course, in Aramaic, and I've read many articles of people claiming Jesus spoke Greek here. I have to say that that is bogus. If Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he was speaking to them in Aramaic. That was the language Jews spoke amongst themselves. We don't know if Jesus knew Greek. For sure, many of his disciples did not, because we we're told specifically when Paul spoke other languages, some of the Romans were surprised, so it was a relatively rare thing to find a Jew who could speak Greek or, Ro or Latin at the time. So keep in mind, Caiaphas, a stone. Here we can just see the statue of, of Peter with the traditional attributes, of course, the key of heaven, standing on the rock, the staff, watch my sheep. And of course, it's interesting also the fish here, the fish not because he was a fisherman, but even though he did catch this fish, this is the fish with the coin, the tax in it. Interesting enough, only case that a fish was caught with a hook in the New Testament, in the house that it is said to be, to Peter's house, actually they found only place in all of Capernaum, they found hooks in the house. But that's a different story. The history of Caesarea Philippi. In 200, 200 to 198, was the Battle of Panion, which took place where Caesarea Philippi is today. The Seleucids were led by Antiochus III the Great, while the Ptolemaic army coming from Egypt was led by Scopus of Atolia. Antiochus III wins and then controls what is today the Holy Land, the greater region, sending the Ptolemaic forces back to Egypt. Here we can see where this took place. 
Keep in mind, take a look. We're on the road to Damascus. Very important and very important road. Becomes very important, of course, <laughs> in the future when Paul heads there. This is where the battle took place. We'll deal with the name of it in a minute. So let's continue our flight up to Capernaum. If the, well, the video didn't play, so we'll, we'll be on the journey soon. Ituria, name out of nowhere. What does it mean? Those are the people who dwelt in that area. In Genesis 25, we are told, and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, and if you look in verse 15, Hadar and Tema, the English, the Hebrew name is Yatur Nafish Vakedma. Yatur, most people will say these are the Eturians. First Chronicles, once again, and they made war with the Hagarites, descendants of Hagar, with Yatur, of course, descendant of Ishmael. Here we have Mount Hermon, a great mountain we can see below us which is where, which is again, the only, the only snow-capped mountain most of the year. It's part of what was part of the Golan Heights, but it is not part of the Golan Heights because it is limestone, just to get an idea. And let's take a short trip. We're gonna head up from the area that we passed over in the video, unfortunately, because it didn't want to open, but we're heading up from the place we will be ending our tour today, and we'll be heading towards Caesarea Philippi. Here is Chorvat Omrit, keep that in mind, we'll come back to there. We're heading up along the Jordan River. Now, it's not really just the Jordan River is not here yet, there are three rivers that come together and form the upper Jordan River. Some of the water actually comes from Mount Hermon, and here we have Caesarea Philippi, the greater city, we can see there are no buses there because there's no tourism to Israel now. So we move on hmm, to Elizabeth Taylor. Why Elizabeth Taylor? In, 10, in 105 BC, Judas Aristobulus, he captures Ituria. He defeats the Eturians. And Josephus, in Antiquities, he says this. He was called a lover of the Griseans and had conferred many benefits on his own country and made war against Eturia and obtained a part of the nation of the Eturians for them and bound them to the, them to them by bound and the circumcision of their genitals. In other words, the Josephus tells us that the Eturians, or at least some of them, were forcefully converted to Judaism. We know that which something that, except for the forceful conversions of the Edomites, the King Herod was one of them, or his father really was. This is another case that maybe there was a forceful conversion. In the year 36, keep in mind, the role of the Greeks, the Romans have already taken over. Nero falls in love with Cleopatra, and one of his ways to seduce her, try to seduce her, he gives her Ituria. We'll see that area. 23, Senodorus, who was an Eturian king, leased the land from Cleopatra. In 19, Augustus gifts the area to his new ally, Herod the Great. And Josephus tells us when Herod had been at Rome and was come back again and war arose between him and the Arabians on the occasion following the inhabitants of Tractonus after Caesar had taken the country away from Senodorus and added it to Herod. So we have the story of Herod being gifted the area. Here we can see a map, which is quite old, but still very good, the area of Ituria. You can see it here, and Caesarea, Peneus, Philippi. So this area was the area that was controlled by the Eturians. Now, here we see a beautiful temple that we're gonna to have to deal with in a few minutes. Josephus in, the, in Antiquities tells us this about the area. So when he had conducted Caesar to the sea and was returned home, he built him a most beautiful temple of whitest stone in Zenodurius's country, near the place called Panium. We'll talk about, nowadays it's called, if you've been there, it's called Banyas. It used to be called Panyas, 
In Arabic, there is no peace, it becomes banyas. Just like Peter in Arabic is butrus, from petrus to betrus to butrus. Butrus, butrus Rali, the former general secretary of the United Nations, was a Coptic Christian. His name was butrus, that's Peter. This is a very fine cave, we'll talk about the cave and the mountain, under which there is a great cavity in the earth. And the cavern is abrupt and, well, we're not going to read the whole thing, but here we have a beautiful palace built for Caesar. Here we're told it's in a place where there's a cave. Here we can see a depiction of what the area looked like. Those of you who visited has probably seen this. We'll tour the place in a few minutes. In 4 BC, Herod dies. We're not going to get into the element Herod dies. 4 BC, Jesus was born zero, but then he persecuted the firstborn. That's another different lecture. Philip, one of Herod's three sons that inherited things or take over. And in the year three, Philip establishes a city called Panyas. 17 years later, he dedicates a larger, that he expands the city and calls it Caesarea Philippi, in other words, in honor of Caesar and builds a monumental temple, maybe here, in honor of Augustus. And once again, Josephus tells us, the great Jewish historian of the time, when Philip also had built Panyas, a city at the fountain of Jordan, he named it Caesarea. He also advanced the village of Bethsaidas. Keep in mind, Bethsaidas, the place where Peter and Andrew came from, which is situated at the Lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. 36, an earthquake destroys the city. 61, Agrippa rebuilds it. That's part of what you saw. Interesting enough, during the Jewish revolt from 66 to 70, there were two cities, two areas, that the early Jesus movement, the early Jesus followers, escaped to, to be saved from the revolt. One is Pella in Transjordan, the other is here at Panya. So maybe they returned to a place that had important Christian meaning. Okay, the god Pan, you can see, not your typical god, of course, feet of a goat playing his flute. His father was Zeus. Zeus tried to pursue Penelope. Some say, some of the versions say he dressed up as a goat. And so Pan was born. His mother was so shocked that she wanted nothing to do with him. The story goes that in battle against the Persians, they brought a statue of Pan to the front. They were so, the Persians were so scared they ran away and suddenly he became an important god. He also allowed himself to get away with many things because of his heroism and because of his looks. And he would continuously try to seduce nymphs. Cyrix was the most famous nymph that he tried to seduce. When Zeus, also Cyrix's mother, father heard about this, he turned her in, as you can see, into a, a cane, into and uh, into a reed, and then, but then Pan was so shocked by that, he cut down the reed and made a flute out of that. So Pan's flute has come into existence. And he was the god of the outcasts of society. One, he was the god of the shepherds. He was also the god of the homosexuals. He was the god of the people who were partially sent out and his temples were established in caves. Here you can see the cave at Panyas itself. This is where the temples were, and temples to, to Pan around the world are in caves. You can see what Josephus talked about. We'll see more examples of this later, of the flowing water. Now it's flowing beautifully. Josephus in the war says, the place is called Panyan, where is a top of a mountain that is raised to an immense height and at its side beneath at the bottom, a cave opens itself within which there is a horrible precipice that descends abruptly to the vast depth. Again, if you go there today, it is not that uh, deep. Some say that's because of the multiple earthquakes that have hit. It, it contains a mighty quantity of water which is immovable. And when anybody lets down anything to measure, the depth of the earth beneath the water, no length of cord is sufficient to reach it. 
Josephus tells us another place the water flows out of the cave. That's actually not the case. It flows, there's a hard level of rock that the water can't penetrate. It comes down, it seeps through the stone till it reaches that ladder level and then flows out from there. Once again, the stables and back to where we were before. Now, let's just move quickly to verse 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. In the Greek, it is Petros. And upon this rock, Petra. Petros is a smaller stone. It's a stone. It's not, it's not as small as Lithos. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Petra is a gigantic rock. That's why Petra in Jordan is called Petros. Let's start learning this. He says, who do they say son of man is? And the son of man appears in three meanings in the Bible. In Ezekiel, we see, he read, but you, God is approaching Ezekiel, but you son of man, you Mr. Person. Another thing in the book of, in Numbers, we say, God is not a man that he should lay down, neither the son of man that he should repent. So a general term to humanity. Psalms also says, what is a man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visited him? But in Daniel, there's already a new meaning. Daniel 7, starting with verse 13. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven. We're talking about a messianic figure and came to the ancient days and they brought him near before him and there was given him domination and glory and the kingdom that all people nations and languages should serve him his domination is everlasting domain which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed like a man in aramaic and again this part of the book of daniel is written in aramaic it says Kivar Enosh, Bar, like we said, Bar Yonah before, the son of, of man. In other words, but like, in other words, it's not actually a son of man, it's something much greater. So Jesus already, when he asked the question, he's saying, who do they say, son of man, i.e. I am, meaning that I am not just a regular person. Beautiful rock on which a church was built, really a monastery, and Metaora in Greece, if any of you ever get there, some of the most spectacular monasteries in the world. Petros, a piece of rock or stone. Lithos, a smaller stone. Petra, a very large stone or a boulder. And once again, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Kephas, really Kaifa which is by interpretation a stone. The word in Aramaic was kaifa. Let's have a quick journey through rocks and the stones. Because with that, because what is usually missed to my subjective opinion, when reading the text, we don't go into when Peter was declared, you are the stone, which I think is the correct interpretation. Where do stones appear in the Bible and what are their meanings? Because it's quite amazing how many different meanings people will understand stones as being. You can guess what the story is in Genesis 28, 28 and, he light, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of the place. He put it and he dreamt there. So, uh, But then later on, and he dreamed, and behold, the ladder, and they're going up, they're descending. And then in the morning, and Jacob, and Jacob rose up in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it as a pillar and poured oil. He anointed the rock. He made it holy. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. An anointed stone becomes God's house. Okay. Another stone. And he looked and behold a well in the field and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered the flocks and a great stone was upon the well. Comes Jacob, moves the rock, a rolling stone. 
in this case, to feed for water. Another interesting story. We have Sarah cannot give birth to a child and she turns, she gives Bilha, her maid, and, and she said, behold my maid Bilha, go in unto her and she shall bear on my knees that I may have children by her. Then she said, here is Bilha my servant, sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and I too can build a family through her. No stones. But if you read the Hebrew, Vatomer, and she said, Hine Amati, here is my here is my maid Bilha Bo Eleha. Really the, the actual translation would be come to her, Vateled Al Birkai, she shall give birth on my knees, Va Ibane. The word for rock in Hebrew is Evan. Ibane, I will be built, I will be established. So there's a direct connection, and there's that play on words there, even though Jesus was probably speaking Aramaic, but the play on words between son, ibane, evan, rock, clearly comes to play. Now, here we have another story. And Jacob took the stone and set it up for a pillar, and Jacob said unto his brethren, gather stones, and they took the stones and made a heap. And they did eat on the heap. And Lavan called it Yagar Sahaduta, is the name in the Hebrew name, but Jacob called it Gal Ed, which is a pile of stones. So that is, a, and it's a base of an oath and, uh, and an agreement. So rocks can have an oath to it. Now, here is something which is very important to keep in mind because that's why I, that is, some people translate. Petros as a boulder, as a gigantic stone. I say that's wrong for this reason. Again, problem with the translation. Talking about God, he is the rock, rock of ages. He, his work is perfect for all his ways are judgment and God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. The word used in Hebrew for that is tzul, not evan, but tzul. Tzul is a gigantic stone. That's why the translation should be stone or large rock. Ha ha, rock altar. God specifically tells us, and if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. This is an actual Jewish altar found in Beersheba. Was used probably up to the times of King Hezekiah, maybe the times of King Josiah when Altars could not be used outside of Jerusalem. In those days, they still were a complete, you can tell by the horns that it is most likely a Jewish altar. But once again, direct connection between stones and sacrifice. Hmm. More interesting things. The most famous of the stones. We're not going to get into the individual in the picture. And the Lord said unto Moses, come unto me into the mount and be there and I will give thee tablets of stone and the law and commandments, which I have written, and thou mayest teach them. Once again, stones and the commandments. Another thing connected to stones, which is a slightly different story, the priest shall command them to take away the stones in which the plague is. In other words, there's something which can be translated as leprosy of the home. And then the stones are taken out and cast. So there's a connection between impurity or the impure home and those actual stones, the unclean place. Thou shall not have in thy bag divers ways a great and small, but thou shall have a perfect and just weight. The word in Hebrew, again, not translated, even shlema, a whole stone v'tzedek yelach. There's a direct connection between stones and justice and honesty because you can carve off. So once again, stone, Peter, maybe an element of honesty. Let's keep on going. What else were stones used for? And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, again thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the stranger, and then we continue going, and they sacrifice to the molech, they perform idolatry, he shall surely be put to death, how the people of the land shall stone him. 
Stoning is a type of execution. Jesus specifically mentions that in John chapter 8. He says, this they said tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up and said unto them, he that is without sin amongst you, let him cast a first stone at her. The element of, of stoning the adulterer. So stones were used for execution. In reality, it wasn't throwing really throwing stones at people. It was throwing somebody off of a high place and then stoning them. Similar to the temptation of Jesus by the devil on the, at the temple. And that's how his brother James was executed. Here's a phenomenal thing that unfortunately most people who visit the spot stop by and pass by it. This is in Tel Dan. Maybe we'll have a tour of Tel Dan in a future talk. The Bible tells us that in the entrances to, to Jewish cities, there were pagan altars so people could pay honor. These stones you see here are actual idols. You, you think that an idol should have a face maybe. The traditional large idols are carved stones. There's an actual altar dating back probably around 2,800 years, an altar in the entrance to the city of Dan, one of the two cities where the kingdom of Israel built their temples. And we are told, ye shall make you no idols, no graven images. Again, two different things, because idols are not, don't have an image. So here we see the actual idols that were found in Dan. Another phenomenal find, this is in a place called Tel Gezer. Gezer is one of the three cities we are told were built by King Solomon, major cities, other is Chatzor in the far north, Megiddo, Armageddon, and Gezer, which he was gifted by pharaohs, by Pharaoh when he married his, when he married his daughter, and he erected 12 pillars and covered them with white. This is actually a place for spilling of blood. We have a different story, also with the 12 pillars. We had it with Moses and Mount Horeb. And here we, we read, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the children of Israel entered the land of Israel, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing and carry them over. And they erected the stones and that was, and that they, they're asked later, what do these stones mean? We will be asked in future generations. Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So erecting 12 stones is a reminiscing of a, a tradition, actual 12 stones found in Tel Gezer. Here we have five stones. And the story of the five stones. David hasted on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the riverbed in front of us. This is the area, the Elah Valley, where the battle of David and Goliath took place, Jerusalem to the east, the Philistine cities to the west, Mount Azekah, which is here. Here's the valley of Elah flowing through. This is taken from the top of Mount, of, of Mount Azekah, overlooking where the children of Israel would have stood, looking at the battlefield. Now it's beautiful vineyards, gorgeous, gorgeous area. Hopefully you will all be able to visit there. Another story with a different meaning of rock. And here you can see all the meanings of rock that people might have read into. Jesus' disciples might have understood some of these, and they for sure did, are connected. And then we can understand maybe what the meaning of the rock is. When Abigail went to Naval, because once again, David requested Naval to help him. He laughed him off. He was a rich man. David was going to come back and kill Naval, and Abigail, his wife, saved it. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king, even though David was the king. 
He was in high spirits and very drunk. She told him nothing at all until daybreak, what she did, how she saved him. Then in the morning when Naval was sober, his wife told him all the things and his heart failed him and he became like a stone. In other words, the term that is used here is for a stroke. A stone, you become like a stone, your heart becomes like a stone, you die. Another element that people will for sure, and Jesus' disciples will for sure see the connection to the stone, Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed to your servant, David is speaking, saying, I will build a house for you so your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Once again, no rock mentioned here, but evne, even in Hebrew, evne, I will build. The temple is built, stone, same word. My favorite church in the whole region, and this is one of the two small chapels in the Church of the Transfiguration, of course, depicting, Isaiah, depicting Elijah after defeating Ahab. Then Elijah said to the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took, remember again, 12 stones. And then in verse 32, with the stones he built an altar. Worshiping God, stones, remembrance, altar, sacrifice. Each person can read into this without too much difficulty. This is the center mosaic of the church. Beyond spectacular, of course. You can see the three disciples Jesus took with him. Moses and Elijah on either side. Here's a view of the church, really, truly one of the most spectacular churches in Israel. This is what it looks like from the outside. 150 years ago, depiction of what Mount Tabor looked like then. Here is what Mount Tabor looks like today. Just a little anecdote I have to make. This is the town of Daburia. How do we know this is Mount Tabor? To an extent, thanks to this town. Daburia, derived from the name Debra. Many Arab towns will preserve a biblical name and then we can link them to the spot. Deborah the prophetess, here is where she prophesied. Here she stood underneath the male palm tree and prophesied and then the battle took place in Megiddo in Armageddon a few miles away. So Daburia, named after the prophetess Deborah. Okay, here we have the south eastern corner of Temple Mount. This is where the tradition Jesus was tempted by the devil and where James, his brother, was executed from. And of course, Isaiah tells us, There thus saith Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a foundation stone, a cornerstone, tri a, tr a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. And on that, of course, as a sure foundation. So once again, Peter building, I shall build my community, my church, the cornerstone. And uh, the prophetic element of Isaiah 60, for the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed, but my, but my, kin, my, my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of peace be removed, saith the Lord, that mercy on thee. And thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, with tempest, and not com comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, colorful, rich stones. Once again, the story of the future prophecy over Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 10, we're told about, then I looked and behold, the firmament that was above the head of the cherubs, the kruvim, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone, a precious, precious stone. And once again, the prophetic saying. And once again, Ezekiel tells about, and I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take the stony heart, or in Hebrew it says a heart of stone, out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. Once again, the prophetic element, read it into the rock. This picture did not come out well, but this is the remnant of the wall built when the Jews returned by Nehemiah, 
Zechariah tells us about Zerubbabel, the leader who came back. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by, by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. One of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, to my opinion. Then, Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, grace, grace, upon thee. The prophecy of the end of days in a way, once again, the headstone. Here we have the, the headstone in a place called Kalat Namrud, very close to the Banyas, a phenomenal Mamluki, 13th century fortress. You can see the rocks moved, but the archway did not collapse during the earthquake in the year 133. In the book of Psalms, we read, the stone which the builders refused is the headstone, or really, here we have the Evan Rasha, the headstone, which is the stone that supports the whole archway. Here we can see that archway entering the phenomenal fortress there. Once again, the, the, the famous song, where uh, unfortunately Leonard Cohen is not around to sing it for us, but a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. Jesus is gathering the stones of Peter in. The destruction of the temple. How is the, the, and again, these are stones that were, this area was destroyed near the southern part of the western wall by the stones tumbling with the destruction of the temple. This is the original road from the time of Jesus. And here we are told, how was the gold become dim? How was the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary. The word in Hebrew is avne kodesh, really sacred stones are poured out. So stones have a sanctity to them. We're almost finished. Nehemiah says, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the walls, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? Revelation, reviving, bringing back to life. So here we had many, many meanings for stones. We'll come back in one minute to deal with that, but you can see when Jesus says, you are Peter, you are a stone, and on this stone, or on this Petra, this great stone, I shall build my community, you can see what immediately went through the minds of his disciples. Keys, Isaiah 20, 20, and it shall come to pass in the day that I will call my servant Eliakim. Eliakim means God will keep, God will make it happen, the son of Hilkiyahu, which means God gave to him. Chelek, his portion, God gave him his portion. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. And here comes the verse that we can understand the meaning of the keys and the key of the house of David. I give the keys of heaven, David, in the Jewish tradition in those days, the future Messiah comes from the house of David, will I lay upon his shoulders so he shall open and none shall shut. We'll see that in one second again. And he shall shut and none shall open. What you open on earth, exact same thing, so we can understand the context of what we're talking about. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? To open access to God's blessings. Now, What's interesting, if we follow Peter, he then reached out to three communities, in other words, opening the doors of heaven to them. In Acts 2, we're told he tried to reach out to the Jews, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, Judea, who Jew or Judea, the Jews, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, only the Jews dwelled in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. The other group that he reached out to were the Samaritans. In chapter 8, we read of Acts, 
Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter. So once again, Peter has the keys to heaven. In other words, the meaning is I read it. If we read just into the simple element of the text from within what the Bible tells us, this is what Jesus was trying to say. And last, the Gentiles. And saw heaven open. Now we, we, we were told about Peter going down to Joppa, and he has a very strange dream, which the strange dream is he sees all the animals, and God tells him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter says, I can't eat them. They're not kosher. And God says, no, Peter, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything. And God, and the voice respeak, responds and said, well, God hath cleansed that call not thou common. Now, to my opinion, and I'd say most scholars, which I wouldn't list myself in them, understand that he, God is not telling Peter, eat any animals you want, is go out and reach the world. Because of course, in that same chapter, Cornelius is converted, he reaches him. And once again, the house of the keys of David. Now it says the gates of hell. Now frequently it's translated the gates of Hades. It is not can't be the gates of Hades because Jesus wouldn't have talked about the gates of Hades because that was pure paganism here, of course. We see the gates of hell by Rodan, one of the spectacular pieces of art, a bit disturbing, but that's a different story. What are the gates of hell? Isaiah says, the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness, I said, in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. The translation, the Hebrew is Sha'are She'ol, the gates of hell. I am deprived of the residue of my years. In other words, if you didn't live out your years, you wind up in hell. Job says, have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Once again, you go down the doors, but the concept of there are actual doors that lead into the various areas. So when they're talking about the gates of hell, they are literally talking about the gates of hell. Genesis, we're told about Jacob, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gates of heaven. So there are gates of heaven, and there are gates of hell. And we're told, and whatever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And once again, Hebrew, the an amazing reading has been read into this. If we just look at the basic element, open, closed in Hebrew, patuach, open. Petach also means an, an opening. Sagur, something that is closed, just like it says, Vashem sagar et rachma, that where he prevented, well, many of this, many of the women in the Bible from having a child. In other words, her uterus was closed off. Literally, Isaiah says in, in chapter 56, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose, pateach, the bands of wickedness? You can, that's what you have to do, Mr. Peter. And then do the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free. Ezekiel has the exact element of open and closed. Thus saith the Lord, the gate of the inner court that looketh towards the east shall be shut the six days, but on the Sabbath they shall be open. The element of opening and closing of gates. Isaiah 22 that we read before, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. There's the direct connection between the keys of heaven and opening and shutting on earth and in heaven. Here we're going to have a short tour of Panias. This is the temple. We're going to head up towards the temple of Pan. Here we see the whole huge rock that is there. Here we see remnants of the temple that some say is the temple of Augustus. This is an actual small altar for, for incense that actually survived. This is what the temple would have looked like, built in the entrance to the cave where there was a cave built for Pan. Here we can see the court of Pan and the nymphs, and in each one of these areas there would have been statues. Here we actually see an inscription 
from 87 AD, dedicated to Pan, son of Dionan, and it's and also to echo one of the nymphs. And here is what it would have looked like. Interesting enough, in each one of these niches later on in Christianity, they actually had statues that were connected to Christianity. You see the huge rock, as we are told by, by Josephus, an, an additional temple that was built to Zeus there. Here are the remnants of the earthquake that caused everything to collapse. We're not sure which of the earthquakes was this, because there were too many earthquakes. Was the earthquake of the year 36? Was the earthquake of the year 333 or 363? We do not know. This is an amazing place, because in here they found many, many jars with burnt remnants of goats. Because again, keep in mind, with, with, with Pan being the god of the shepherds, here then the temp here's the temple of the dancing goats, Later on, this was converted into a church because we know that in the, in, the, in the first conclave in Nicaea, there was the Bishop of Panias. In other words, there was a substantial Christian community here, maybe connected to the fact that this is where the whole story took place. Here we see a coin from Caesarea Philippi, and we see that temple that we're told built to Augustus with the four pillars, in reality, even though we see it in the, in the depictions, Josephus tells the beautiful white temple that has never been found there. But Josephus tells us this, and when Caesar had further bestowed upon him another additional country, he built there also a temple of white marble, hard by the fountains of the Jordan, but the whole area are fountains of the jury. The place is called Panion, where it is on the top of the mountain. So where exactly that is, there's arguing claims. Some will claim that this is where it is. And here you can see remnants of a temple discovered just 10 years ago in a place called Churvat Omrit. You can see the beautiful base of the temple with stairs leading up. These are perfect white limestone pillars that are found just a couple of miles away from where Panias was located. And here we can see the area of what was discovered there. This was all covered with ground, even though there was a hundred and some odd years ago, a preliminary research of the place. Huge four pillars, as we're told by Josephus, a white temple, and interesting enough, originally a Greek temple, not a Roman temple. Later on, it was converted. We'll get another interesting view of this in one second. Oops. Here, once again, we can see the area. This is the most beautiful time of Israel. When it's filmed, March, April, everything is in blossom. The whole area, we can get an idea. This is what the whole area looked like. And when they started digging, this is Mount Hermon behind us. Snow is already melted. And here we can get a nice drone view of what was discovered of this spectacular temple. Now, to go back to where we started, let's think. We were told in Mark that they stopped alongside the road. This is exactly on the road. Where would Jesus talk to his disciples? If he's about to expose such an important message, he does not want to be where other Jews would be. In other words, no better place to go than a pagan place of worship. Only problem is in Caesarea Philippi itself, there was a substantial Jewish community. Even though I've heard many times people say it was a totally pagan city, totally not. There was a, actually, there's, there's a discussion where the remains of an early synagogue were found there from the first century, probably yes. So you stop on the road to Caesarea Philippi. This whole area beyond here was part of the city of Caesarea Philippi. You stop by the road. You won't go into the temple because a Jew will not enter a temple. So even though most people visit Caesarea Philippi and visit the site of Panias as the place where Jesus spoke to his disciples, even though that doesn't appear anywhere, it never mentions Panias, it mentions the city of Caesarea Philippi, 
along the road, this would probably be, to my opinion, a more probable location where Jesus would have addressed his disciples. So when you come to Israel, ask your guide to take you here. It's a bit off the road, easy walk to get there, and you'll see remains of a beautiful temple. And keep in mind, <laughs> the rocks, the multiple meanings of rocks. So what is the meaning, according to Matthew, how would I conclude and interpret? Jesus said, you are Petros, you are Kaifa, you are the stone. And on this stone, this stone, in other words, this establishment, I'm not, you are not going to be this. And there's a, there's a relationship between Peter and the stone, but there's also the play on words, we said, that his disciples, even if he was speaking in Arabic, Aramaic would have understood from this Evan Ibane, from this rock, I will build my community. And Peter, you will be the leader of that community. So, so again, it's not the church, so it's not Rome. It's not an ecclesia as it's translated in Greek, but it's the foundation and the rock and all the meanings of the altar and the sacrifice and the honesty and the integrity that, Peter, you have. You're given the keys and you can do as you please. So to conclude our talk today, we had a short visit of some beautiful parts of Israel in the far northern part, bordering with Lebanon and in the past with Syria. Let us keep in mind the establishment, the base took place in this place where the first time, according to the New Testament, Jesus was recognized as the Mashiach, as the anointed one by his disciple Peter. And Peter was given the name Kaifa. And when we understand the meaning of Kaifa, we can understand the mission of Peter. So thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to seeing you in our next talk. Thanks, Joel. If you've enjoyed this lecture and would like to see more, please give a thumbs up and subscribe. Information on our biblical tours can be found on our website, christian-travel.com. And again, a link is in the description. Thanks again and goodbye.